as the events of last week drew a lot of attention in Washington, D.C. to stable coins and the broader crypto markets, we'll take a look to start the week at where D.C. is looking at crypto more closely. The U.S. and the E.U. are looking to the blockchain to track greenhouse gas emissions, and Ripple as a company has already taken proactive steps into the ESG space. We'll take a look at what's happening there. And SBF. FTX CEO and founder has said that Bitcoin has no future as a payments network. What might be a better option in the crypto space? I think you know what that might be, but we'll take a look at what he had to say. But if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. Let's take a quick look at the crypto market before we dive in. We're down about 3% on the 24 hour, back to 1.26 trillion. Bitcoin is back under 30K. Ethereum just a hair over 2,000. XRP right at that 42 cent mark. Still in that six spot, you can see everything basically red on the day. Still down double digit percentages on the seven day. And not a great start to a new week as we're here in the middle of May 2022. Now let's look at what's happening in Congress. Before we get into that, just a quick reminder, the 25,000 subscriber giveaway linked in the video description is still going on. When we hit 25,000 subscribers, I'll be giving away 2,000 treasury each to five winners. So make sure you enter if that's something you're interested in. Again, that amount unlocks the utility X distribution for treasury holders. So do check it out if you're interested. Now, Ron Hammond has a lot to say for us to keep us informed every week. We start by looking at what he has to say with Congress and crypto. So here we go. His words here. Last week's crypto crash did not go unnoticed in D.C. For months, Congress has grappled with stablecoin legislation. However, algorithmic stablecoins were something not on the radar for most, and the question remains, what now? Here's the latest. For the past several months, Congress has ho hosted multiple hearings and briefings on stablecoins. The technology is appealing to most, but the latest concern or largest concern uh, was with Tether audits, redemption, and reserves. Algorithm or algorithmic stablecoins were too small and new to be considered at the time. It wasn't just Congress. The Biden administration's presidential working group report on stablecoin regulation barely considered algorithmic stablecoins and heavily focused on fiat-based stablecoins. This report put the ball in Congress's court, saying they would need to craft legislation. Even amid the crash last week, Secretary Yellen testified several times that Congress needs to craft a comprehensive and bipartisan regulatory framework for stablecoins. That is a pretty tough lift for a number of reasons. One, it's an election year, meaning Congress has little more than 50 days of votes before November. Two, partisan tensions are high as each party focuses on campaigning mess or campaign messaging themes from inflation to Roe versus Wade, the economy, Russia, gun violence, and so on. And bipartisanship is tough around this time. However, that doesn't mean it's impossible and there has been bipartisan support around the regulation of stablecoins. Several members of Congress have introduced bills on this topic and I can confirm that there will be more released in the coming weeks. Typically, regulators will act in the event Congress does not, but Secretary Yellen repeatedly pushed this framework needs to come from Congress. A natural starting point will be the presidential working group recommendations, but even some Democrats disagree on points like all issuers have to be banks. The good news is that Congress has really made a point to learn about stablecoins rather than calling for a blanket ban or one-size-fit-all approach. They understand there's a difference between Libra, USDC, a CBDC, and UST. Not all, but many of the major players on this topic. But what is the right approach to a comprehensive regulatory framework? That's still a tough task, and Congress doesn't have much time. Getting a bill through the regular legislative process takes time, and many members have different views on the best approach. So what will happen over the next few weeks? We will likely see regulators step up enforcement. 
in the crypto ecosystem. Congress likely will have a hearing or several briefings on the recent crash and springboard those into educational efforts into or those educational efforts into legislative text. As these proposals become public, many of the key stakeholders will try to reach a compromise that they believe can be both bipartisan and comprehensive, as requested by Secretary Yellen. The problem is that many don't know where to start with algorithmic stablecoins, and that will consume time. Is it possible something gets done by the end of the year? Yes, but not a high chance, solely given the plethora of other political issues. Additionally, there are so many divisions on the issue of prudent regulation, especially on the Democratic side, which will make it hard to move. Finally, many Republicans see little benefit to working with their Democratic counterparts because it's likely the Republicans will have the House and Senate, thus giving them more control in 2023 over the legislation. Regardless, the final effort needs to be bipartisan to get signed into law. For now, expect the crypto critics to be more empowered, regulators to be more aggressive on enforcement, and industry advocates launching a full court press to educate Congress. The crash is just as big as the Libra News in D.C., and it is unlikely D.C. looks the other way. We've talked about this at length over the course of several videos. Uh, this will be the thing that sort of um, riles up people like Gary Gensler on the regulatory front, Elizabeth Warren on the legislative front, as they seek to rein in crypto, bring it under their power and influence. Now, with the timing here, we are in the middle of May, and the uh, election is the beginning of November. There's not much time to really get anything done, especially with summer recesses and holidays and all those sorts of things. And I just don't know that we're going to see any major legislation make its way through. While there'll be a lot of talk, there'll be some hearings, and maybe we'll get some key insights on how regulators might try and approach this in the near term. I just don't see anything from a legislative standpoint really making it through before the election at a minimum in this year. It might not happen as we were hoping. So more to come. Of course, I will keep you posted on the legislative front. Now here, the EU and the US are looking to blockchain to uh, track greenhouse gas emissions. And this is something that has become a more hot button issue. Uh, climate is certainly a big topic of the day. We saw the head of the securities um, exchanges globally, the commissioner of that organization at least, call out COVID, crypto, and climate as being the three C's and where they're uh, most concerned. But the Trade and Technology Council is a diplomatic forum established by the Biden administration in 2020 to serve as a mechanism for coordinating technology and trade policy between the U.S. and the EU. And in a joint statement just published today, they reported one of its working groups, the Climate and Clean Tech Working Group, would be collaborating on several initiatives related to the reduction of carbon emissions, one of them, or one of the aims of this group, is to improve the methodology and process for tracking carbon emissions and examining emerging technologies, including blockchain, to track emissions more reliably. Now, this might not normally be a topic of discussion for us. However, if you recall, we talked a month ago about Invert and Ripple announcing a partnership to collaborate on carbon credit uh, investments. This is interesting because you can see this coalescence of what's happening with the governments in the U.S. and the EU and then the private sector here as Ripple is trying to take a lead here, sort of in the background. I don't know that this really got as much press as it probably should have because it's a big opportunity here to sort of meet these needs of other government agencies. So while the SEC might not be happy, you might have other agencies like the EPA or even here a joint entity here like the Trade and Technology Council taking a larger interest in what's happening with crypto and uh, blockchain technology and how it might have an impact on these ESG initiatives that they have going on. So I won't rehash this because we went through this in full in that previous video, but I will link both of these articles in the video description along with everything else if you want to read into it a little more. It's some interesting things, and as it becomes a more and more focal point of conversations uh, throughout this decade in particular, we've seen a lot of climate goals and objectives now through 2030. Uh, I think this conversation will continue, and it's good to see ripple at least being proactive here 
Now, before we get into the main topic of the day, I just want to shout this out in case you see the new chair I'm sitting in. I actually got a channel sponsor here that I wasn't expecting, but Odin Lake makes uh, these mid-tier office products, uh, ergonomic chairs. Now, if you follow the channel, you've seen the chair change probably four times in the time we've been together. I spend uh, 12 to 14 hours a day right here between the channel, between the work I do. Uh, you know I work in corporate finance, and so because of that, I'm always at my computer. And I've had a lot of lower back pain since working from home. Uh, I've been in car accidents before, and it's exacerbated the pain. But now having a better uh, ergonomic chair has really made a difference, and uh, they are now a sponsor for the channel. So there's some discount codes in the video description if you are interested in upgrading your home office setup if you're working remotely or if you just spend a lot of time in front of your computer they have a core product all the way up to the pro and uh, there's some good discounts down there if you're looking for an upgrade uh, i'll talk about it more in the future with some more details but really a great product and i've noticed a significant difference in my own posture as well as comfort as i work from home so do check it out if it's something that you need or are interested in but now, as we get to the main topic of the day, Bitcoin has no future as a payments network per FTX chief executive Sam Bankman-Fried. This is really interesting. It came out over the weekend, and we didn't have a chance to be together again until just now. So I did want to touch on this because he highlights things we already knew about Bitcoin, but... Uh, it sort of opens the door for the conversation of what might be better. And I think you and I know that XRP provides a fantastic option here for this category as a payments network. We know that they have a leading blockchain that is cost efficient, fast, and reliable. But here's what this article says. It's a real short one here on the Financial Times, but good to see some of the direct quotes that he has here. So Bitcoin has no future as a payments network because of its inefficiency and high env environmental costs, according to one of crypto's most influential chief executives. So, you know, as we say, XRP Ledger, efficient, doesn't have that environmental cost. It's basically the opposite of what Bitcoin is from a payment standpoint specifically. So SBF, founder of FTX, said the proof of work system of validating transactions, which underpins Bitcoin, was not capable of scaling up to cope with the millions of transactions that would be needed to make the cryptocurrency an effective means of payment. The Bitcoin network is not a payments network, and it is not a scaling network, he said. His comments came as the fast-growing crypto market was hit by a punishing sell-off that left Bitcoin down by more than 35% since January and at its lowest level since late 2020. Bitcoin is still seen by some crypto enthusiasts as a way to conduct everyday transactions. Countries such as El Salvador and the Central African Republic have adopted Bitcoin as legal tender, but recent research by academics in the U.S. found that Bitcoin has scarcely been used for daily payments in El Salvador despite the rollout of Bitcoin ATMs and other measures to encourage its use. The 30-year-old billionaire who has expanded FTX into one of the world's largest virtual asset exchanges said an alternative type of blockchain known as proof-of-stake or other technological innovations would be required to create a functional crypto payments network. You don't really have to go to proof-of-stake to find it, though. We already have seen what the XRP ledger is capable of. Ethereum, for its part, has been working to move to proof of stake, which is intended to be less energy intensive. Things that you're doing uh, millions of transactions a second with have to be extremely efficient and lightweight and lower energy cost. Proof of stake networks are, he said. His criticisms of Bitcoin underscored serious environmental concerns about the amount of energy needed to run proof of work. Some euro regulators have called for a ban on the systems owing to their carbon emissions. Mining Bitcoin consumes more energy than many countries, including Norway and Sweden, according to Cambridge University's Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index. It has to be the case that we don't scale this up to the point where we're spending 100 times as much eventually as we are today, 
on energy costs of mining, SBF said. FTX has used carbon offsets to compensate for the company's emissions, which he said was worthwhile because, but not a complete solution because you just run out of things to offset at some point. Despite his views on Bitcoin, SBF said he believed the world's digital or world's biggest digital asset had a place in the crypto market. I don't think that means Bitcoin has to go, he said, adding that the token may still have a future as an asset, a commodity, and a store of value akin to gold. So while we certainly don't think that Bitcoin will go away completely, its functionality for payments is where it's deficient. It doesn't have the efficiency and transaction speed required to handle the kinds of payments that are needed to be able to move money to transmit value across the globe. This is why we, in general, in the XRP community, and here on this channel in particular, think that the XRP ledger is really one of the greatest options in the digital asset space for sending money for those cross-border remittances, for helping small and medium-sized enterprises to be able to eliminate some of the problems that they face in their businesses. So there's a lot of opportunity ahead. And while Bitcoin may not be optimal for payments, it has other use cases. Lots of cryptos out there, lots of use cases. And as we've seen with the most recent shakeup, the ones that provide the best options and the best utility for their investors and backers are the ones that are going to rise to the top and find that longevity that evades so many in the crypto space. I hope you found the information here to be helpful. If you did, hit a like. It helps the channel a ton and make sure you get the information most important to you. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already so I can keep you up to date on all the future news as we go through the week. And of course, stay tuned for the Frank Joe Crypto Show every Sunday. If you missed yesterday's episode, I'll link it down in the video description. Thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me. I do truly appreciate it. Have a fantastic rest of your day and start to the week and I will see you in the next one.